This is Linux Unplugged, episode 31 for March 11th, 2014. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's doing everything it can to switch every single user to Linux. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Welcome to episode 31, buddy. This week, I want to talk a little bit about uh, something you wrote a great piece on Datamation about, and that is, are Ubuntu haters pushing away Linux switchers, potential Linux switchers? Are those people, like, scaring away people that are looking into Linux? You know, with a lot of hate and things like that. And uh, I know I... I recall from when I switched to Arch, I I ran into a lot of that. Did you experience that, Matt, during our Arch challenge? Oh, yeah, definitely. A lot of, like, do it this way, don't do it that way. Yeah, I I like to call it Arch think. I I think it was basically they had a pattern of thought that worked for them, and they expect you to to adhere to that pattern of thought or screw you. Yeah, and if you don't do it that way, there's something wrong with you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, now, it's gotten a little better over time, but still But I think, you know, in in the context of Arch, I think that's given the community a little bit of a bad rep in some senses, that particular kind of behavior. And I I think kind of this point in the Linux community, Ubuntu haters... Drinking the Ubuntu Hater 8 is kind of like it's world famous now. Everybody's in on it. Everybody knows an Ubuntu Hater. A lot of us are Ubuntu Haters. Not not necessarily. I'm I'm pretty neutral. I know Matt's pretty neutral too. Uh, But you do have to think about it in the context of like people's first impressions and how that sort of forms their opinion about the Linux community. Um, And I think that's going to be interesting in sort of the shadow of this Sunday's last. Here we are. A year after the announcement of Mir. And um, we're going to break down some of the things that have made people kind of upset with Canonical, and I think Mir is one of them. So it's kind of, I think it's a perfect time to talk about this in light of that. But first, Matt, it is tradition to start with the feedback. And we got a lot of feedback last week about replacing Exchange. We've been talking about what's preventing people from switching to Linux from a technical standpoint, right? You know, uh, collaboration software, um, AutoCAD. Big one, big one. Yeah, uh, games, um, you know, just general education, you know, about the existence of Linux and the options there. There's been a lot of things, you know, ease of use that we've covered on this show that we think are preventing people from switching to Linux. The groupware thing has definitely been one of them. So this this couple of emails we're going to do will sort of wrap up that discussion around the technical stuff, and this week we'll sort of kick off the discussion around the community stuff, the people stuff. So we'll start with an email from Dwayne. He wrote into the show responding to the whole groupware thing. He says, hi there, Chris and Matt. Well, hi, Dwayne. Good to talk to you. He said, I listened to Linux Unplugged, and I heard you mention Colab and Zimbra as possible solutions for your office. While you're at it, check out Univention. It's meant to be an open source replacement for folks who don't want to use Microsoft software solutions to start with or are moving away from them. He says, thanks again for the sweet show. I use BitTorrent to get all the shows. Can't risk missing any of them. And he includes a link to uh, Univention. It's U-N-I-V-E-N-T-I-O-N.com. And they have, a, they have a small business edition. And it's sort of like a drop-in exchange replacement. Oh, I like that. I yeah. lo- especially if it's truly drop-in and you can just kind of slide into that. That's fantastic. Now, um... I think he's using mm. Thunderbird as his front end. Uh, we heard from a few folks that sent in different different stuff, uh, but uh, this was this was kind of a popular one. Uh, another one on the topic of the exchange replacement. Kevin writes and he says, "Hey Chris and Matt, you asked what people did for email contacts and calendars, so I figure I'd share you, I'd share my open system with you. Basically, I use IMAP, CalDev, and CarDev to, CarDev to access my mail contacts, etc." I originally used Google for all of the above, but migrated away as they shut down CalDev and CardDev support. He says, I still use them for my email, though. Now, the other two reside on my local own cloud server. Oh. Mm-hmm. This is great because I'm using only open standards and everything stays in sync across my laptop, desktop, and phone. Also, because of the protocols I, uh, I use, it is easy to migrate between services if I decide I don't like them for whatever reason. Now, no, or sorry, no need to change applications or workflow. Just change the host. Uh, for clients, I use Thunderbird on my computers, and my apps on my Android provide CarDev and CalDev backends for Android Sync, allowing it to work with all apps. I use the Gmail app on Android. That's the only non-free part of his setup. But I also have K, used K9 in the past. Cheers, Kevin. This is this is kind of uh, 
This is interesting. I, you know, it's not it's not a full solution because he still uses Gmail for his email part. True, true. But I, you know, I know OpenCloud's a popular solution for this. Um, I think it's an interesting approach. I mean, if he's able to make it work and he's able to make it work for him and to as he you know builds his stuff out, it's still working for him. Then I think he has a winner. I do dig his point about how uh, because he's using IMAP and Card CalDev and CardDev, um, <clears throat> the back end is really sort of just an, an implementation detail. And he can right. swap that out to another system if he decides for some reason that OwnCloud isn't doing the business for him anymore. That's a great point. And I think that's actually an excellent point. Didn't OwnCloud just have an update uh, like today? I believe so. Let's go check. I think, I think, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure. But I think OwnCloud 6 just shipped today. I have to go over to OwnCloud.org and take a look. Uh, but I, 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 I've, I've been considering using something like OwnCloud. Uh, there's, a, there's a few other alternatives that I want to review soon on the Linux Action Show that look like they're really good systems. Uh, so I'm thinking about maybe, uh, maybe doing a couple of, uh, like a roundup of like the one I really like, and then maybe I'll even deploy it at the new studio. That's kind of the, that's kind of the goal I'm, I'm shooting mm-hmm. for. But... Uh, yeah. That would be awesome to have this totally no- – because it's like starting out – it's not starting out completely fresh, but it kind of is because it's at a new mm-hmm. locale. You mm-hmm. can actually start the whole everything the way you wanted it from the get-go. Uh, the own cloud site isn't loading right now, so uh-huh. uh, I don't know if they had it. Maybe that's a sign that they did have an update because right now <laughs> I'm just yeah, getting a blank page and it's just waiting for owncloud.org. But I think version 6 – I want to say version 6 came out today. Uh, maybe the chat room knows. They can, they can let us yeah. know. That's All right, Matt. Well, well I, let's see. We'll give that own cloud site a second to load here, and I'll uh, say thanks to one of our sponsors this week, and that is Ting.com. Get started by being proud and going to Linux.Ting.com. That's right. Represent. You got to go shout it out, you guys. Linux.Ting.com. Uh, what is Ting? Well, I'll tell you what Ting is. Ting is no BS mobile service. It's simple. It's straightforward. It's mobile. It makes sense. No contract. You only pay for what you use, flat $6 per line plus taxes. And then it's just your usage on top of that. Ting takes your minutes, your messages, your megabytes. They add it all up. Whatever bucket you fall into at the end of the month, that's what you pay. Every Ting plan includes hotspot and tethering. This is, for me, this is so awesome because right now as we're setting up the studio, there's no internet there. And it is so weird to be in a building for hours at at a time and not have internet access. I'll just be honest with you. You can't do it. It it, it just, it, it hurts on the inside. So what's so great about Ting is I just, if I want hotspot or tethering, you just check the box in Android. You know, that, that, that feature that Google built in for a reason. Yeah, you just check that box. No special plan. I don't get in trouble for not having a data plan. I don't have to have a family share, whatever. It's just part of my data usage. And Ting makes it super easy to monitor where my data usage is at with their awesome intuitive control panel. I can go in there and manage all of my devices, disable, enable, activate devices, set up alerting, set up call forwarding or voicemail options. You can really take control of your Ting account and ultimately your own bill. And they have very straightforward, plain language billing. When you see that bill, you know exactly what's going on. There's no surprises. They also have companion iOS and Android apps to manage your Ting account right from an app on the device. And Ting has no hold customer support. You can call them between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. Eastern. And uh, just call them at 1-855-846-4389 and a real person just answers the phone. You don't have to go through some sort of call tree or something. Well, isn't it great that you can walk into this brand new studio that's still being very much set up? I mean, it's still in dis- disarray for the most part, and you have internet out, out of the box. You don't yeah. have to worry about it. Boom, yeah, it is, it's super nice. It's internet in my pocket, and it's actually really great internet. And today, if you have a, as Ting is announcing, if you have a Sprint compatible iPhone 5, you can now activate it on Ting. Or you can oh, grab cool. one if you just want to go get a new one from Ting, whichever you prefer. Uh, this is great because I know not everybody in our audience is an Android lover. And uh, the iPhone 5 is a great device for uh, iOS users. And now you can, you can use it right there on Ting. Or you can buy, uh, they partner, Ting will partner up with Glide. And you can help, uh, you can go through them to get a used device, to get it at a great price. But if you already got one, you can bring it over. And if you're in a contract, Ting has an early termination relief program. Well, they'll pay, they'll pay up to $75 per line that you had to get canceled. They'll apply that to your account. Now, average Ting bill before taxes is like 21 bucks a month per line. Um... I think mine is about 30, 35 bucks right now. Yeah, Man. so $75 credit, that'd get me quite a ways. Uh, yeah, definitely. I definitely. Know I know it. Well, and I think, you know, you're talking about people that wanting to use iPhone. I think it's important to remember that while a lot of us may be Android people, we may have family members mm. that we're bringing onto Ting with us that perhaps would like to use iPhone. And we very much do. Yes. And we very much thank Ting for sponsoring Linux mm-hmm. Unplugged. Linux.ting.com, you guys. Go check it out. Just Woo. visiting there lets them know that you appreciate them supporting the Linux Unplugged show. And plus, Pretty cool that we got Linux. Hey, oh, there we go. 
Uh, own Cloud Six, yes, <clears throat> the Own Cloud site loaded, and Own Cloud nice. Six is out today. So that's something we're gonna have to check out. I'll put this uh, on my list for uh, uh, Sunday to do some research on, and maybe even uh, download it and check it out. Congrats I think to it's the worth checking out. Yeah, there have been some reports that there's some bugs in the new features and things like that, but it uh, might be worth looking into. Yeah, I'll do some digging. I'll dig around. So if anybody has any experiences, please share those in the LinuxActionShow.reddit.com subreddit. And uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, incorporate all that into our feedback on uh, Sunday. Ish. Okay, so Friar Tuck wrote in, Matt. And uh, this is sort of just rounding out our coverage on the technical limitations for people switching to Linux. It's the other popular one, AutoCAD. He says, hello, Chris and mm-hmm. Matt. I've heard you both mention in, the, in passing that the lack of AutoCAD solutions is a major drawback to Linux. Well, I'm a CAD technician who provides IT support in my office as needed. When I hear your discussions about the enterprise Linux adoption, I can't help but apply the issues to my own office. It seems to me that my office could get by fine in the Linux space except for certain engineering-related software, mostly Autodesk and Bentley software. I'd love to see a show dedicated to available CAD solutions under Linux. I've heard of Blender, but that seems to be mostly for digital animation applications. But what else is out there? Also, I'm worrying about Steam streaming for CAD solutions. Thanks so much for all the great informative content. I'm new to Linux in general. Oh, that's great. And a crown and uh my crowning achievement so far has been getting Ubuntu up and running on my old MacBook. Nice. <laughs> Good for him. Lup has been his gateway. I like that. So yeah, hey, audience. Um if you guys know of some AutoCAD replacements, I don't I mean, I know there's some stuff out there, but this is just not my area. I don't really know a lot about CAD software outside of Really, the AutoCAD commercial. Solution. Well, and someone that can help us look at the available options and say, okay, they they all to, uh, to you, Chris and I. I mean, they look the same. I mean, they really. I can't make heads or tails out of one versus another. But if someone can help us understand what the benefits of one versus another are, or whether one's more stable, runs better, one's on Java, one's not, whatever it may be. Yeah, that's exactly it. Perfectly put. Like they all just look the same to me. You know, yeah. it's like okay, well, I see. I, there's some sort of CAD thing here. That's yeah. awesome. I can draw stuff. I mean, I don't really know what I'm doing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you remember uh, last week at the end of the episode, we had an email from Scott, and Scott was a little concerned about c- the amount of commercial software that is now coming over to Linux and sort of yep. taking Linux and uh, sort of perverting it into this closed off commercial money making platform. Well, sure. uh, Mark wrote back uh, uh, to reply to Scott, and uh, he said, regarding the discussion about whether we should be happy with proprietary games on Linux, here's how I see it. And I think Mark nails the way I see it, too. He says, my system, utilities, and application software. I want that to be free. Mm -hmm. If I'm browsing the web, if I'm editing documents, etc., I want the code open to inspection, improvement, forking in case of developing it or going away, or maybe the development turning bad. But my entertainment, I don't care. If I watch a movie, if I've got no interest in having access to the raw footage to make my own cut, I don't have any interest in making my own raw cuts of it. If I play a game, same deal. It's a piece if it's a piece of entertainment that I'm paying for as a complete article. If the license allows me to be entertained by it and the pro- and the price is proportionate to the amount of entertainment I get, then that's fine. Cheers, Mark. Hmm. That's exactly hmm. yeah. how I see it. It's like I, yeah, for Steam games to me, that is not as important as the system utilities and the and the day-to-day applications that I have to have to actually work and I need to be able to have trust in. For me, it's sort of like buying a movie theater ticket. Yeah, I think I'm going to equate that because it's exactly the movie theater ticket thing. Are we going to complain? I mean, it's like the rule you can't bring in your own food and drink. You know, that, that doesn't feel very open, now, does it? <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you think about it, we're choosing to go there to do this. You know, we, we could very well wait for it to come to Blu-ray. That's fine or however we may get it. Uh, but the point of the thing is, is that that's exactly it. It's like the the fact that the, the movie's available for us for our entertainment. It's not it's not cog- it's not a critical piece of our life you know it's not a critical piece of our uh, job or our ability to do stuff at home so yeah i would agree with that yeah um yeah that's totally. how it's yeah and i said that's why like for me i kind of like have this man not a big deal for games yeah um but you know if if I like, I love the fact that my entire desktop environment is, is open source. That's uh, true. Our last uh, bit of email this week, Mike writes in, he says, uh, Hey guys, first of all, thanks for the awesome show. I listen to Linux unplugged and last, and I love it. I just thought I'd quickly share with you. One of, one of your sponsors pleasantly surprised me today. I signed up with digital ocean a few weeks back. I had heard of them on your show being me. <laughs> <laughs> I know this one. <laughs> Being me, I forgot to use your promo code. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. He said, uh, so anyways, I was able to go back in and edit my uh, my order, figuring I'd probably missed out on it, but why not give it a shot anyways? 
uh, I said, I went in there, applied it, and to my surprise, they actually still applied the discount. Oh, wow. Yeah. He says, yeah, when you're in there, there's a promo code field in your account settings, and you can apply the discount. And he says he's been rocking his digital ocean droplet uh, ever since then. So why don't I stop right here before we get into the, uh, the rest of the show and thank DigitalOcean, our second and last sponsor this week here on Linux Unplugged. What is DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting. They're dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can create a cloud server in 55 seconds or 44 seconds like some of our audience. I don't think mm-hmm. anybody's beat that yet. I think 44 is the record. And pricing plans start at only $5 a month which gets you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte. Yes, a terabyte of transfer. And that's a fixed cost. Boom, $5. You know exactly what you're going to get. And that's that's so perfect because it's 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 way more than enough machine to do a ton of the things you want to do, like host an own Cloud 6 installation or a BitTorrent sync installation or a car dev server, whatever it might be. That's more than enough. I've been running an Archbox up there for months now, and the performance is outstanding. Plus, DigitalOcean has locations in New York, San Francisco, Amsterdam, and now even Singapore. They have a simple interface, very intuitive control panel. Power users can replicate that control panel on a larger scale using the straightforward API. And I want you to get it with a $10 credit so you can try out that $5 box for two months for free. And trust me, this is a great way to learn something. You will find something to do with this. I sure have. And I love it. Just use the promo code Linux Unplugged March. Linux Unplugged March. All one word, $10 credit. You can try the $5 machine for two months. And you will you will really be impressed. The, the clean, easy to use control panel is absolutely excellent. The droplet system makes sense. If you've ever worked with VirtualBox at all and you understand the concept of snapshots, you're going to totally get this system. They make it really easy to back up your box before you make any changes to template off that. You can have auto backup and snapshots. You can one-click install WordPress or one-click install Ruby on Rails. You can deploy an Ubuntu box, 1204 with lamp or docker or a fedora box whatever it might be in 55 seconds too guys you can do this in with just no time if you've only got a couple of hours a day or a week even to experiment with this kind of stuff this is how you can do it you don't have to set up a whole rig in your house you don't even have to funky around with virtualization software on your own machine for five dollars a month and heck we're with with linux unplugged march we're going to get you two months you can just play around get a machine up there make a snapshot of it before you try something cray cray and if it barks it, just revert back from that screen, from that snapshot. It's it's like being able to to run your own Linux server with training wheels and nothing's going to go wrong. And that's what makes it great for production as well. Because if you ever have something up in production on DigitalOcean, why wouldn't you? They have tier one bandwidth. Those SSD hard drives scream. The KVM virtualization is awesome. We all know that. And it's backed by amazing hardware. So why wouldn't you throw it into production? And now you have that safety net. If something goes wrong on your production server up in the cloud that you have root access to that runs whatever distribution you want, one click and you're back up and running. And you could try it all for two months for free. Linux Unplugged March. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. I mean, two months for free. I mean, it's like, it's actually, it actually costs you money not to try it at that point. And it <laughs> costs you it. your soul. Right. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, okay, Matt, before we go on, we got a Valve update real quick. Just to talk, we got to talk a little bit about this, like it's storming the internets right now as we're recording this show. Valve has announced they're going to solve all of our problems. Never fear, Linux users. They have released a direct 3D to OpenGL transition layer. Everybody go home. Job's done. Is that right, uh, Wizard, or did I get something wrong there? Exactly what you think it is. It's actually going to be something that you can add to your actual pro- project after the fact to bring something else up to date. So it's going to be something like I can apply to, you know, X old game to go and make it so that I can run it on Linux. It's not going to be something that everyone just installs in their repository and it's going to be this magic wine fix. That's so, well, yeah, I was going to say it almost sounds like wine then. You no, know, it's not going to be something that you. It's it only goes and translates the DirectX calls to OpenGL calls. That's a, it's like the project itself is called Two GL. So okay. it's um it, yeah. If you want to look at it, it's on uh, uh, GitHub right now under the Valve software. That's pretty cool. So you yeah. been have you been taking a look at it? Yes, I have. It's all written in C plus plus, so very readable. Hmm. So uh, this isn't really going to, I mean, now that you know, you've kind of brought me up to date on it, it kind of seems like, uh, I guess this is one overhyped. more, what, what's that? I kind of find it, to, it's nice, but it's a little bit overhyped. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, and I was kind of playing to that that whole overhyped aspect of it. But it's neat. It's neat, and uh, I'm glad to see Valve open sourcing software. Yeah. Absolutely. What was the license? Is it uh, GPL? Good question. I didn't look. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't see it right here on their page either, but I know they have a license file, so I'll go jump in there. I bet they... I bet you in the license file it'll tell you. Um, but all right, well, thanks, uh, Wizard. I'll uh, toss you back up to the main room, and we'll join the main room, too. And uh, I want to kick around uh, something that uh, came out on the web today. Uh, you guys probably saw this. Uh, Will Wheaton took to Google Plus and uh, made Mark Shuttleworth cry when he announced that <laughs> he's not crazy about the direction Ubuntu is uh, taking. In fact, the yes. uh, exact quote that uh, Wesley Crusher said, I mean, Will Wheaton said was, yeah, I'm not crazy about Ubuntu. I feel like the entire project has gone in a direction that isn't Does for that me. Mean, uh, Sheldon likes Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. The, the big yes. bang joke started immediately, yes. Uh, okay, <laughs> exactly. Uh, he went on to say, I love just about everything about my MacBook Pro and my iMac, so I don't see myself going to Linux full-time again. But I really do love being able to explore tons of open-source packages and play with different kernel options, desktops, and all those things that I need to do, all those things that I don't need to do, but still have fun doing anyway. Uh, Being a hipster intensifies. Well, well, uh, to, to end his defense, I've, I've actually, you know, I've met him before, and I will tell you, he's an old school Linux guy. He's actually waded through it. He's slackwared with the best of them, but he did kind of evolve into kind of a Mac, a Mac mindset, if you will, over time. So he did his time in Linux. It's not like he's some passive guy just coming through and talking smack. I, mean, I he, think he some insights. I think the Linux community's pride blinds them from seeing the real threat. I think maybe we also still see Microsoft as the threat, but I think the reality is the real competition is Apple. I think it's I yeah. think from all, they have they have compelling hardware that people a lot of people like, not everybody. Uh, the fact that they can sell so many computers without ethernet ports blows my mind, but it's, it's a <laughs> thing apparently. Uh, uh, and they um they offer sort of a uh, at least the idea of a turnkey computing solution. And I think that is, uh, I want to I wanna sort of keep that in mind as we talk about the overall Linux community's abrasiveness sometimes when it comes to um, issues that they're passionate about. And Matt, you touched on this in an article you wrote for Datamation saying, is Ubuntu animosity misplaced? Uh, kind of from a high level, like, uh, what's the concept here? Basically, I'm looking at it from this perspective, I, I, and I always take the Ubuntu perspective for two reasons. One, it's what my editor would prefer, and secondly, it still covers most of the Linux universe just by default anyway, so it's really a mood issue in that regard. But the point is, is that a lot of people come into Linux, and people I introduce to Linux, they go to the forums, they go to these different places, or especially on the social media sites, and they see a lot of real negative behavior. I mean, it's really unfortunate, the kind of stuff you would expect to see in a Windows form. Um, you know, you like to think you got away from, got away from that, but in, in the Linux space, it can be really prevalent. And for a lot of people, it's a turnoff. But also going deeper than that, I feel like that – so what got these people to that mindset in the first place? And a lot of it does come down to uh, Unity, uh, other yeah. aspects of Ubuntu as well. I you, mean just really you, nailed you down the You did a good job. You, know, you said uh, yeah. uh, Ubuntu simply needed to give Unity more time in development before releasing it. Because of yeah. that, it got you know a big backlash from the community. Simply put, nope. you said, I believe some folks within the Linux community felt like Ubuntu was isolating itself with this move to Unity. I think that's probably a fair point. And that caused some – hurt feelings and then or, or you know uh maybe hurt feelings is the right way to put it but it caused people to um take sides and then you said you know down the road you had the uh mirror versus whale in tobacco which we're very familiar with uh, mm -hmm. you said when it was first announced uh mirror was to be ubuntu's choice for xorg's replacement once again the linux community sounded off at the time i took a stance on the matter that explaining I took a stance on the matter, explaining that if Mir didn't get at least one additional distro to use <laughs> uh, to use it as a display option, I would wear a monkey suit for the masses on last, well, it's 12 months later, and I've lost the bet and prepared to pay the price initially agreed upon. Now for the bitter pill. You don't want to hear. The casual computer user couldn't care less about the issue. So long as the applications work ex as expected, I suspect we'll be seeing shrugs of indifference throughout the Ubuntu masses. No. I see this as a battle of wills between developers and their opposing views. And I think he nailed it there. Yep. And I think if you look at Will Wheaton, what he just said, he couldn't give two craps about well, Wayland versus Mir. And he also defeats the thing that it's only new users that don't care. He is not a new user by any stretch. Oh, great He's, point. So I yeah. think this is something we've got to appreciate is people, uh, you know, as their lives get busy, just because, just because they might not be um, 
uh, they might be technical people, but they might just decide mm-hmm. that they don't have time for drama or they don't have time to right. follow this kind of stuff. And that can be a whole off-putting thing in itself. And you say the back and forth was perhaps even more heated than we'd seen than the Unity versus Gnome challenges in the past. Like the Mir versus Wayland thing was like every time they've had something, that event has been more hotly contentious than the one before it. That's true. And it seems to be like like the animosity is building on itself and building on itself. And it's like this snowball that just keeps rolling. And then, of course, we get into the whole upstart versus system D discussion, which, you know, Canonical and Ubuntu weren't directly involved in. But you say, unlike the Unity versus Mir debate, upstart got the attention of a fresh new crop of Linux users as it directly affected how a Linux distro starts and stops events and services. So even if you're not a system admin or a developer... This affected anyone who uses Linux on a day-to-day basis. Definitely. And I noticed a lot a lot of people that normally wouldn't care one way or the other about desktop environments or whatnot because they just use something else. This affected them more so because it was under the hood. It's going to change how they do things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you said, of course, the CLA at its core, the CLA is perceived as a barrier among many developers within the Linux community. You, you mentioned Linus Torvalds expressed his displeasures with all CLAs in all forms. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, that's been a real concern for some developers. And you mentioned in your closing thoughts that the Linux community is passionate, involved, and sometimes overtly loud when it comes to the <laughs> direction yes. the platform is headed in. That you say, while users such as myself try to be re- try hard to remain neutral and not act as though using our computers is a religious experience, the community at large continues to make their voices heard, no matter the cost. Now, what do you think that cost is? I think a lot of times the cost is that we create unnecessary. Uh, you know, contention between each other. I think a lot of times that we become so focused on stupid stuff that we really lose fo- lose focus of what's going on in other areas. For example, like let's look at the Chromebooks and how Chrome's doing its thing, and the, you know these things are selling really well and whatnot. Rather than focusing on outdoing Apple, outdoing Google, outdoing other stuff, I feel like we focus in, on our internal squabbles so much mm. that it really. Not only is it, it doesn't solve anything, it just makes us dig deeper into our own personal camps. Well, yeah. but um, we ignore I, I, bigger bigger issues. I, I don't. Think. I'm not sure if, if if you're thinking about it right because I mean, there's a lot of things that that are huge deals. You know, like what side of the window is the close button on? <laughs> oh my God, I know. Oh, and the la- and how I used to. No, I'm guilty of this. I used to bi- I used to bitch constantly about the lack of a minimize button. And no, I made a big stink about it. Just and I went on and on and on and on about it. No one cares. I mean, you know, <laughs> it was my problem, not yours, right? So it's like, why why would anyone care? But I'm the, I'm guilty of this as well. I'm just as bad as the other guy. Riley, what are your thoughts on the Unity? Uh, hate? Well, there's a like interesting about Unity too. Is there's a large user base who would actually yeah. use Unity on other distros if they could. Mm-hmm. Sure. Like oh, yeah. People would use Unity on Arch if they could, yep. but since they can't, they just hate on it. I actually think so, Unity is maybe the the ultimate example of uh, stuff that we argue about that actual <laughs> users don't care about. Because <laughs> here's true. the thing. Uh, uh, even if Unity was, quote unquote, the most terrible desktop in the history ever, it doesn't matter. If you if you are even slightly Linux technically inclined, you know how to use a different desktop. And if you're a new user to Linux, you really probably have no problem with Unity because truth be told, it's not that bad, especially if you don't come in with preconceptions. And no, so, it, go ahead. it honestly isn't that bad. It's a very pretty desktop, especially mm-hmm. if you've used it 1204 board. It's right. actually halfway stable. I don't so, care what you say. I think I think it's something that general users just don't even know they should be caring about. And and Ick, you think somehow like uh, maybe user choice plays into all of this? Yes, absolutely. Here's yeah. the thing: we keep talking about over and over again. Linux is about freedom and choice, and sure. it's something that I wrote actually on the subreddit. When it comes to desktop environment, use whatever you like the best and works right. best for you. Don't let anyone talk you into something else just because they like it more or have some other agenda. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. 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 Rotten Corpse, you switched your mom over to a Unity desktop? I did. How'd it go? She's been using it for about two years now. <laughs> I, I nice. like it, I guess? Yeah, she has no problem with it. The The thing is, I, I was using it at this time because I was testing it out and I wanted to kind of like have her opinion on it. And because she's a completely... She doesn't really care at all. All of the DEs and stuff like that's irrelevant to her. It doesn't matter. So when I look at Unity, I find the little flaws and stuff that I don't like and a few things that I do. Like right. the Dash, I don't like it almost at all. But I asked her what she think about the Dash. She's like, what's that? And I explained it. And she's like, yeah, I don't care. That's, that's cool. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, yep. see, I've had so uh, I had my dad running an older version of Ubuntu with Unity, and he really liked it. He was coming from. Oh, it was either XP or seven. It was before Windows okay. eight, and he was switching over, and he ran Ubuntu for a little while. And what he ran into is kind of what you touch on here, Matt. Is you say, and sort of closing out your article, you say, "My concern is that newer users who have just come over to the Linux side of the fence will be scared away by some enthusiasts and their misplaced animosity towards Ubuntu." Will this color how the majority of newcomers see the Linux community? It did for my dad. Yeah. And, and I've seen evidence of it. I don't just, you know, I actually have people that I talk to about this stuff before I write this stuff. Yeah, yeah. he saw it. He saw, you know, when he was, so he had two problems, I think. First problem was, is he wasn't really clear on where he was supposed to go to look up problems. And like, right. so he wanted to, uh, he moved at one point and uh, they didn't have internet access. They didn't have like cable or DSL where he'd moved to. And so he wanted to tether to his phone Sure. and like trying to look up. And he was at work and trying to do like the, the, the Googling at work and then bring that home. Uh, he got so many different results and so many different mixed messages on that whole thing that it, it, and I don't, I wouldn't blame it all on this, but I think it definitely, inf when it came time to buy a new rig altogether, he just kind of decided to go get a Mac. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because it's an all inclusive experience. And, and much as I'm not in any way a Mac person, believe me, I really don't like them. At the end of the day, they don't sell a computer. They sell an, a, a collective experience. Yeah. yeah. They it, really do. And you know, they have the whole, the whole genius angle to it yeah. too. So he was able to ask the guy some questions. Um, and I, I, so this article you wrote really resonated with me here because, um, not only did I see that through my dad's experience, but when we were taking the arch challenge, there was, equal parts really good advice that I got from, you know, some awesome people on our subreddit and mm -hmm. things like that. And there was equal parts really like hostile bad advice that I got. Right. Everything from trying to scare me away from using Arch and telling me how hard it is to use and how I, I really have to keep the system maintained. And it turns out to be like the easiest Linux box I've ever had to maintain. Right. You know? That it would be unstable because you're using bleeding edge. Yeah, that was, that another, was another one. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't use this tool. Use that tool. And it's... I, I, and I suspect this happened for you too, but it gave me pause for a little bit where I thought, I don't think I want to deal with this. Right. And I don't, I don't like this. This is, I don't need this, you know, and, and it, it's even more nuanced than it is in Arch because in Arch, there's multiple ways to install a piece of software. We're like in Ubuntu, like pretty much at the end of the day, every guide's going to tell you sudo app git install, right? Yeah. Add this PPA. Like there's consistencies. So you can get a lot of different you get a lot of different information, but they all kind of tell you to use the same tools and do the same things. Not the same thing in Arch. Now, thankfully, that wiki is very authoritative and has a lot of good info. But when you're just switching, I felt like I had a lot of mixed messages. And I can so I'm I think that experience might be what a lot of new people get when, like, you know, they're reading a comment thread and there's just tons of Ubuntu hate in that comment thread. Um, I would agree. And I, and what you said about the wiki, the problem with the wiki is that it's 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 too good. And, and and what I mean by that is that the information in the wiki blows other distributions out of the water as far as accuracy. But the problem is locating and knowing what to search for to find it. That's the rub yeah. um, for a lot of people because you don't always know. Like when I was but, trying to figure out the whole battery life for – you know the battery life situation for my netbook – I wasn't necessarily finding exactly what I was looking for until about the third or fourth search, and then I, <laughs> then I clicked. Yeah. And the information was fantastic, but it was finding it. So I think if they can hone that a little bit, the information is gold. There's yeah. no problem there. Yeah. Right. Some people actually suggest people to look at the Arch Wiki to find the information, which is a good idea, but they'll also suggest to the people who are not using Arch, which is right. very awkward. Now, yeah, yeah, that's true. Rod, I, you were gonna you were gonna say it kind of depends on the existence of users of Linux to make regular users' experiences a little more easier. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I was basically just gonna say that when when people talk about moving people to Linux, they always think about you know, hey, telling the advocate of why Linux is good and why they should use it, but they don't necessarily make that transition easy. Like for example, with my mom or my roommate or, or my neighbor, I've moved over. I set up their computer. To, I find out what they want. I put, I put the Linux thing that I think fits best for them, the distro, I mean, and then I put on the different apps that they want. Like for one of them wanted WoW, so I had to put Wine in, so then I oh, put yeah. WoW connection. And is, if you give them Linux set up where they can have it just how they, what they just the stuff they want to use and the things that they would be used to, like the way they get Windows, but it's already installed, if you do that for them, the transition to Linux is almost negligible in as far as like whether it's hard or not. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. I used to support Linux at a uh, small bookstore in uh, a town north of me, 
and uh, I actually the service calls were well they went from a ton of them to none yeah uh, as long as I maintained the machine it yeah was I problem, definitely problem noticed uh, during I, I used to joke um, you know when when uh, my clients would ask me like so what should we do here for this desktop and mm-hmm. I would tell them you know I uh, I, I would say I uh, thankfully a lot of my clients use Windows I'm very thankful for that right. because it gives me 10 times the amount of business that I would have <laughs> exactly. if, if they ran Linux. <laughs> and that's not just yeah. me like guessing. That's like literally from my experience, like I can put Linux in and once things are set up and stabilized, like Rotten Corpse is saying is I would go in there and I would configure everything for them. Right. right? And I would even set it up so it would take snapshots of their configuration settings and all of that kind of stuff and back those up and we could restore them very simply. Um, and Webman was a great tool to help some some their their local tech gal uh, set up users and stuff like that, uh, and that worked so well that I would literally lose money on those clients. Exactly. Yeah, that was that when I switched to Linux full time is about the time I got out of repair. Don't know. Um, Ick was going to say <laughs> our problem here is that we've been conditioned by Microsoft. What's going on there, Ick? Well, here let me just go ahead and set the Wayback Machine to like 1995 when Windows 95 first came out. People were up in arms that their programs were not right there in front of them like they had on the program manager of Windows mm-hmm. 3.1. Now, fast oh, wow. forward 19 years later, now everybody is looking for that start menu. If they right. don't see that start menu, they are up in arms. It's just like, okay, <laughs> uh, now Microsoft has conditioned us to operate this way. And see, that's the thing people are assuming that a desktop environment such as unity is unintuitive just because they're not used to it i suppose exactly. yeah that's mm-hmm. the ding mm-hmm. you get. get give him the ding give, so you want that that man has earned a ding all right well here you go <laughs> there you go you get a ding <laughs> uh dave you were gonna say that uh maybe we just need to cater to each specific user that's your go, man. That's your go right there. No, nope. that's your go. Right. Well, yeah. that's what I think what he was going to essentially say, and I don't know. He has a little bit of lag, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's complicated. No, what I was simply going to say is every user has their own sensibility of how a desktop should and should not be. I mean, uh, you have people who use uh, Windows 8 perfectly with and without touch, and you have people who see the Macintosh interface and see that's the perfect desktop. They can't use anything else, regardless of of, you know, uh, whatever it is. So every user has their own sensibility of what a desktop should be and what their workflow should be. So uh, while we're arguing about what the perfect one is, well, thinking of a hypothetical... Right, a, a magical user that that doesn't really exist. That's true. Like me. Exactly. Yeah, like me. That, that's very exactly. true. Exactly. That, that's what I'm kind of go, <laughs> driving at, is that intuitiveness is subjective. Yeah. True. Yeah, and I think... So this goes going back to Apple is the big threat here. Um, I think that the thing about Mac OS that you got to wrap your head around is that it's it's not a great desktop in a lot of ways. Like when I use it for, you know, I have several machines here in the studio um, and, uh, you know, to me, it feels very old. It feels like um, it feels like I can, you know, I remember the Macs from the 80s and I still see a lot of influence there. Uh, And uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's that amazing of a desktop. I think it's what Matt's saying is that with Apple, it's this hardware, good enough software, better than the alternative, which is Windows, and uh, that support package. And I think when you're somebody like Will Wheaton, and that price isn't a factor, because that's, the I'd say, the number one argument. Once you take out all the freedom and the open arguments, which if, you're not even, if you don't even know to be concerned about that, that's not even part of the equation – Right. If you take away that and you take away the cost barrier, because for a huge segment of people, that's not going to be an issue. Uh, I think I think Apple is a fierce competitor to Linux. I think it's I think it's much more of a threat on the desktop than uh, than Windows is. Well, it is, so especially sort of, for someone coming from Linux, because they can drop down to a command line and do anything they need to do. Yeah, I mean, that's like, the other thing. Like, look at Miguel Itacaza, the you know, one yeah. of the original GNOME developers who fain- who eventually just threw his arms up in the air and said, you know what, I'm going to go get a MacBook. But you could sort of get that equivalent on Linux easily if you go with something like Ubuntu and System76. I mean, they have excellent True. customer support, magnificent hardware. On top of generally, they ship on what like LTSs. Yeah, um, I think this is this is an everything. important piece. Is this is this is why I'm a System76 fan? Is because yes. they, they they are also creating that entire end to end experience. But the problem is, is we don't have enough people doing that, and it's right. you know it's like. Whereas Apple has this massively established presence and brand, uh, and I, I just 
you know, we do our part just to spread the word about System76 because I think it's a really important, I think that whole entire product package is super important. And I think one way we can achieve that today is in larger installations, like at schools and at businesses where you have a person that comes in and rolls out a system for a whole bunch of people. That seems so ripe for the Linux desktop picking to me. It's ridiculous. It's just this, maybe a few software applications, but that just seems so ripe. Whereas, you know, that home user who's, you know, uh, uh, you know a 30-something 30 30 hipster that just wants to go down to the mall and, and, and buy a metal MacBook, I don't know if we're going to be able to get that person. But I think schools and businesses and any time where you can take the experience and you can build it around the need, I, I, I think Linux is such a slam dunk for that. Uh, well, that's sort of already happening now. We see Chromebooks and Chrome OS, which is technically Linux based technically. In, in educational areas all, all the time now. It's, <sighs> I mean, it's becoming increasingly popular. That just makes so, me sad. So I think the, the formula to, the, but, you know, to making this work is the fact that it takes a multinational company to make this happen. Right. What Apparently I was going to say yeah. is that what it, it, goes, it, it boils, down, boils down to the same thing that Matt has said a bunch of times, and that is marketing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's Mac. Mac stuff. The software is is okay, and it's built on stuff that was already there. To it was already good in the first place. So it's like if you took LXDE, put a dock on it, it's very close to the way Mac works. Or like GNOME three, or you know, if you spend a couple hours configuring KDE, right? Uh, yeah, you can have. A, I I really believe you can have a a more modern experience desktop. That has better efficiencies. It's in some ways, can, especially uh, I think for GNOME three, can be more user friendly. Uh, I agree. I I just this is such a this is such a problem, and I just kind of want to, and I guess I want to bring this back to how the community can make a difference here. And I, we're not going to convince everybody to you know lay down arms and embrace each other in a kumbaya. But I have an idea. What? <laughs> what if the GNU project? Because they always want Linux to be called GNU slash Linux. <laughs> they put up money for marketing to make it GNU slash Linux. I'll and do one. That, yeah, I don't know. know I, I think it's is. close. I think it's close. Get a GNU start with GNU slash Linux. Well, here, here's an act- actionable formula of how this could actually be done. First of all, you get yourself a Kickstarter product, project you know, or, or, or however you want to fund it. Some sort of a collective funding process that gets a bunch of advertising dollars together. Then everybody in key metro cities goes to the Google Ad- AdWords program that allows you to advertise on your <laughs> local cable channels, take a Fiverr voiceover of one of those really good movie voices, slap together some great video capture from OpenShot or whatever, just really show off what the desktop can do, make it sound like a movie intro, launch those in each one of those metro areas on television, stop this internet crap, on TV where re- regular people actually get their media, and – Watch what happens. I think you might you be surprised. Virus. Isn't this part of the problem yeah, right. though? Is there's no there's no you know Linux Inc. There's no there's no company that that needs to you know um, capitalize on this opportunity that, that could capitalize. There's individual sure. companies that are all kind of scattered about, and I think that's one of the reasons um, you know Ubuntu has such name recognition is because there's a company behind that, and Red Hat has such name recognition and brand recognition, but there's no one company who's, you know, got the money and the, and the presence to do that. And so maybe let me, let me shift the conversation here. Is this why everybody is so hard over mobile? Because it's a, uh, it's the grand reset of this technical century that we get to start all over again. And, you know, uh, everybody is, everybody is a fresh and new and the, the possibilities are endless. Is that why everybody's so hot on mobile? Hmm. Boy, well, maybe yeah. it's because they have right now essentially two platforms that they have to look at only, and they're so massively widespread now that it, 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 it's since it's, it's easy for people who are not yeah, computer users, even just regular people who just want a tablet so they can watch something like Netflix, Netflix or something. It can bring that so many more people to look at your stuff, so people are just kind of like jumping on the bandwagon of any kind of mobile device of all. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's a lot easier to get mobile devices in the hands of individuals around the world. And the fact that, you know, True. there's billions of individuals around the world that still don't have a mobile device. That's a huge user base True. that a company could target. Well, and like Dave is saying in the chat room, everybody loves a computer in their pocket. But Wimpy, what kind of tipping point do you think we're at? What You say we're at a tipping point right now? Well, tw- 20 years ago, Apple was... Um, yeah, yeah. In in uh, excuse the colloquialism, it, it was in the shitter. 
and yeah. um, yeah. you know it, they've really turned their fortunes around. And and the two companies that are really driving um, popularization of cutting edge technology at the moment are Apple and Google. So I think the tipping point that we're at right now is that Microsoft is is on a downward trend. Um, they're hanging on to traditional markets and really not succeeding in that. And I, I think the tipping point we're at is with with Apple and iOS and Mac OS X and then Google with obviously Android and then Chrome OS. And I think it will be a battle that's fought out between Mac OS and Linux in the guise of Chrome OS. Mm, well, I which think is... the big problem with Windows is it's sort of like become a tainted name. Like, I know people who won't buy Windows phones because they think they'll get right. viruses. It's a black mark, yeah. <laughs> I agree. Phone. I think the Windows awesome. name is now a black mark on a product, and, and I think the general consumer thinks it's something old, and it's not hip. It's not cool right. anymore. Bingo. I, think, I think that's what's holding back a lot of these Windows mobile devices and desktops. Um, and I think that's... Well, I feel sorry for Microsoft because they can't win. They try and be hip, and then everyone says, oh, we don't know how to use Metro, and then they try and be, like, old school and everyone has a go at them for not being different. It is kind of um, bad for them. They're yeah. trying to be hip again. They're releasing yeah, they're, they're just trying to do it through a bunch of you know people dancing around with, holding tablets and that just doesn't work. Clicking them together. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because well, I do, you know I when I use a computer, day. I'm always running around my office smacking the monitors together <laughs> right. to try and get it to accomplish tasks. I mean, really? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. that's an interesting concept. So and I, I you know uh the whole idea um, is it going to be is it going to be MacBooks versus Chromebooks in the future, and you'll have everybody who wants to save a buck running Chromebooks, but they'll be inextricably forever linked at the hip to Google, and you'll have everybody that wants to drop some cash. We're talking in you know large percentages here buying MacBooks, and uh, is Linux going to be in, is the predominance of Linux going to be this bastardized, closed down, souped up for uh, their commercial cloud services? Um, Client side wait, OS. Wait, 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 wait! You said commercial software. <laughs> <laughs> but would that be? Would that honestly be so bad? I mean, this is open source. People can do. People can do whatever with it that they choose, and people can implement it the way they want. And uh, if Linux adoption requires that companies like Google and, and uh, whoever change it the way they need to, or TV, you know, the TVization of Linux, would that be so bad? Because isn't that sort of the original idea? It's no. negative in the freedom dimension. I don't. I don't know. Uh, it's not. It's not what I hope for. And I think also, you know, we can't really have this conversation without keeping in mind that Linux will dominate on the server side too, and that's going to be all different kinds of operating systems. But it does make yeah. you wonder, like, what the future holds for these desktop-focused distros, and uh, if eventually they're not just going to be kind of. You know, just commu- uh, the, the ones, though. yeah, the ones that survive will be the ones that are maintained by community enthusiasts. Yeah, I've noticed uh, myself, like especially in, I don't know if it's just the point of my life I'm at, but I see my parents and my grandparents and you know all these people around me going and saying, I don't know what to do anymore. You know, they, they've always they've always had, you know, go with Windows if you want business, or you know, go with Mac if you want media, and now they don't know where to go, and you know, it's kind of this weird point where people that you know once thought they knew what they had to do don't know anything anymore. Yeah, it is, sad. A, it is. It's a weird. We're in a weird transition, and I think what we're trying to wrap our brains around on this show is, what do we need to change to get Linux in position to sort of be there to catch a certain amount of people who are dropping away from Windows? And uh, are there things just as a community we could do? And I think we've identified guides, you know, informing people. And one of the things that I want to accomplish with How to Linux once we launch it is. I I think the easy wins are the enthusiasts, the technically inclined people, the 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 folks who want to solve a particular problem with Linux. And my hope with How to Linux is that we can provide an on ramp where we're gonna we're gonna say, here's your problem, here's how you solve that problem with Linux, and that hopefully will be an on ramp there. And then maybe as people play with it, they'll be like, hey, you know, I could load this on my laptop. Right. I could try it out on my lap. And, you know, that's what I'm hoping we can do as a network to help Linux. But I wonder, as a whole wide community, what what can we can we just dial it? Is it possible to dial it down a notch, turn down the hater aid? The system D debates are done. The mere debate seems like it's pretty much, you know, where it's going to be at. 
uh, you know, uh, w- monkey suits will be worn. Can't we all just <laughs> use this as an opportunity to, to, to kind of take a snapshot of where we're at and say, you know, let's just dial it down a little bit and just welcome everybody in. How do we do that? Is that possible? Well, Chris, were you, saying that so. you, you were saying with the how-to Linux, and I really appreciate the work you do because that's how it, your videos is what really got me into Linux, but I think the key really is a shorter videos because I remember I might only want to watch the um, Matt's, you know, how-to section and I'd have to, you know, watch all episode. It'd be nice if we just sort of had, like, lots of little really informative videos. Right, shot of information. they only cover something. Yeah, because yeah. most of the question I yep. get brought up loads is, oh, I've downloaded this TarGZ file, now what? You know? <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> yeah. That's, like, the biggest question I get. Yeah. Well, we're, but that only takes maybe three minutes to explain. We're working on it right now. Um, I'm happy to announce that uh, Ick in the uh, mumble room here and Crash Bandicoot will be joining us. Uh, Ick will be our uh, lead producer, and Crash will be our associate producer on Linux, on How to Linux, and... Uh, We've got a bunch of really great applications. We're going to continue to go through those. I think we'll probably develop uh, a, a bench of producers who can be working on content so that way they can work at their own pace, at their own speed, on the things that scratch their particular itch. And we can have several pe- people working. And if How To Linux takes off, if it's a hit, you know, I want to be able to scale that show up big, I'm, you know, maybe multiple times a week, I want, you know, all kinds of topics. Uh, guides, written tutorials, all that kind of stuff, uh, where it's all, you know, still early planning stages. We're not ready to pull the trigger on any one particular thing, but, you know, we're assembling our team right now. We're getting things ready in place. Uh, and I I feel like even if moving forward, we only capture just the technically inclined, you know, the Windows power users and the sysadmins who've ran Linux for years, uh, but now are thinking about switching on their desktops. I think that's that's a great percentage. That's a big percentage of of, uh, of of users that we could bring over to Linux. Um, so I'm excited about that. Now, before we wrap up this week's episode, coming up on Sunday's Linux Action Show, we're doing a review of the Solid XK desktop. Now, you can go over to SolidXK.com. That's S-O-L-Y-D-X-K.com and download this. I'm using, we're going to do the Home Edition, Matt, okay? So we're going to grab the Home okay. Edition because that's like their latest and greatest. This right. is a Debian-based semi-rolling release that uses the XFCE desktop. And we want to do something kind of new this week. We want to get your review of it. So try it out and between now and during the last live show send us your review on twitter and use the hashtag action review to tweet your thoughts about the solid xk desktop right now between now and during the last live show and then in the feedback segment matt and i will pull up all those uh hashtag action review tweets and read your mini reviews there at the end of the show so you have a chance to get your thoughts in and if everything goes as planned matt the solid xk developers will be joining us on next week's linux unplugged Sounds good. Yeah, so load up your uh, testing box, Matt, and we'll give Solid XK a spin on Sunday. I'll see you then, okay? See you then. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'd love to have you join us live. Go over to jblive.tv, Tuesdays, 2 p.m. Pacific. Remember, daylight savings is in effect now. And you can go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time zones. We've got computers that will do it for you. Also... We want to get your feedback into the show. That's where we get a ton of our content from. Click that contact link, send it into Linux Unplugged. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. See you right back here next Tuesday. Bye-bye.